This week, HPT heads to the heart of the Midwest, where a new champion will be crowned at River City Casino and Hotel in St. Louis, Missouri. The starting field has been narrowed down to nine players who are all prepared to take a seat at the final table and battle it out for over half a million dollars. It's time to find out who's got what it takes to take home that coveted HPT title. This is the HPT. Sit right down, put on your poker face, you with the big dogs now. Better bring your best game, talk trash on your wall. To me, it's all the same, you won't leave with much when you come in second place. And I'm the one with the stack showing seven to the jack on Friday, oh mama, cause I'm sending you back. I'll be the last man standing with the money in my hand. I'll be the last man standing with the money in my hand. Last man standing with the money in my hand. I'll be the last man standing with the money in my hand. Hello and welcome once again to the HPT. We got a lot of poker action for you today, but first I want to introduce to you my guest co-host for the day. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the moment you've all been waiting for. Welcoming my co-host, the voice of the UFC Octagon, Mr. Bruce Buffer. I gotta How tell you, not bad at all, not bad at all. I'm gonna give you a couple lessons in announcing, we'll get you in the cage, and you're gonna give me a couple lessons on the felt so I can win some more money. Well, you know what, everybody knows you from the UFC, but I feel like not too many people know that you're quite the accomplished poker player yourself. Oh, thank you, Maria. I, you know, I enjoy poker, I have a passion for poker, my competitive edge comes out in poker, and I'm proud to say, Playing the poker circuit on the Pro Tour, I've won over $300,000 in the last number of years, and I'm very happy and proud about that. Well, that's very impressive. I'm happy to have you here by my side today. Thanks. And today we are going to start the final table coming from the River City Casino and Hotel in St. Louis, Missouri, and there is a lot of money on the line today. You know, speaking of which, these remaining nine players, they're all playing for a prize pool of over a half million dollars. Now that's some serious, serious cash. Making it to this HPT final table is an accomplishment in itself, but I'm sure all these players will be disappointed with anything less than a first place finish. Well, you know, two of the final tableists, Ari Angle and Jacob Baisley, both have over a million in tournament earnings, so I'm interested to see if that experience will come into play. I think it will come into play, but now it's time to take a look at the money on the line, the chip counts, so let's get to the tables. And first place prize is going to be a whopping 142000 but ninth place finisher is going to walk away with a hefty cash as well, 13306 for our ninth place finisher. In first place, Joseph San Filippo sitting with a healthy stack of 3,817,000 chips, followed by in second place, Ari Ingle with 3,007,000 chips. And our shortest stacks is Kyle Kaislin with 400,000 and Peter Brooks with 362,000. They both have 13 blinds or less, so they've got a lot of work to do. And now the gladiators of the cards on the Blue Felt Battlefield of Champions are about to start. Beginning with blinds of 15, 30,000 with a 4,000 ante, the buttons in seat seven and Ari Engel is the first to act. Actions folding around. Now on to Peter Brooks in seat five. He's started this final table as the shortest stack, and seven deuce is not going to be good enough for him to shove that stack with, so he's going to fold. Paul Felix starts the betting with a raise to 60,000 chips. Paul's in the cutoff here, so nine deuce offsuit may look like not a great hand to be opening the action with, but because of his late position, I think he's just trying to take a stab for the blinds and the antis. Andy Kazin calls to 60,000. Now, I definitely think Andy's call with 8-6 is worse than Paul's raise with 9-deuce in this spot. I don't really see the point of calling the button. I think if you want to play that hand, you should probably be 3-betting and just become the aggressor. Okay, the blinds fold, so here we go. Heads up between Andy and Paul. Here comes the flop, seven king, nine rainbow, but it gives Paul a pair of nines to start off the hand. And now Paul has middle pair, but Andy has actually an open-ended straight draw. So now that eight six is looking a lot better to him. Paul's gonna follow it up with a continuation bet of 40,000 though, which is, you know, fairly small C bet. Andy makes the call. Looks like Andy's gonna play it safe with the open-ender. 
right, Michelle, let's go ahead and see the turn card, right, please. Turn card Here comes the turn, the big 10 to give Andy the straight. And now I think Paul needs to be a little bit worried. The board's starting to get a little more coordinated and he does check it over to Andy. Andy puts out a bet of 80,000. A lot to think about here for Paul. I think that a lot of the decisions in poker is made on the turn because you have to remember when you call the turn bet, the hand's not over. You might be faced with a river bet. And like I said, with that board becoming more and more coordinated, Paul might just want to give up his hand now if he doesn't want to face having to call a river bet. Right. Paul continues with his animalistic poker with a raise to 180,000 chips. Yeah, I mean, that is probably not advised in this situation considering Andy does have the straight. And Paul's turning his hand into a bluff here, which I don't really see the point in doing so. I think it's a call or a fold situation. And he's really thinking here, you wonder, is he worried about the two hearts on the board or is he confident in straight? There he is. He is confident. He's gone all in. An immediate fold by Paul. And I think Andy let Paul get away from that a little bit. I think once you go all in there, there's no chance Paul's going to try to take a stab at the river. Every decision right now is worth thousands of dollars. Let's see who's going to make the right ones and get the biggest bite out of this prize pool. And welcome back to the HPT here from St. Louis, Missouri and the River City Casino. The HPT Championship and just over 142,000 up for grabs. It's anybody's game. Let's send it back inside. Joseph Sanfilippo remains the chip leader. It's still early yet though, but he has over 3.8 million. We've got a couple of people with under 20 bid lines, so they're starting to look for that good rebet shove spot. Paul Felig, Peter Brooks, Kyle Caselin all have that shove stat. Let's continue the play with 15, 30,000 blinds, 4,000 ante. Okay, the action starts with Peter Brooks. Obviously, he doesn't like his hand and throws it in. Over to Paul, same situation. Andy folds it up. Jacob also folds. And Keith raises 80,000 with a 6-3 off. Another interesting raise with a semi-powerful hand. <laughs> And I don't think Ari Engel's going to let that get past him. Ari's a really good professional poker player on the circuit a lot. He re-raises to 205000 with pocket nines. I think it's a standard three bet with his hand from that position. Okay, the action folds to Joseph. Wakes up with the bullets, the biggest hand in poker. How's he going to play this one? You know, Joseph's the chip leader, and if I were him, I think a four bet here would just look so strong. 205. So if he's willing to maybe try to trap a few people, he should just be calling this three bet pre. Raising. But doesn't look like he wants to take that route. All right, Joseph raises it up, puts out 500,000 in chips. And I also just think if you do decide to four bet there in fast play, that sizing's a little bit big. And like I said, a cold four bet looks so strong. And I think Ari might be able to get away from his hand here. It's a strong bet against a pair of nines. I'm sure Ari's on a 50-50 thought right now. And Ari does decide to call. Doesn't quite believe that Joseph would have as strong of a hand as he does making that size. Like Bruce said, I think he's putting Joseph on maybe ace-king, thinking he's flipping here, wanting to see the flop and proceed from there. Here we have the flop, queen, 4-4, four, four, rainbow flop with a pair of fours. You know, that's obviously a very safe flop for Joe. He knows that his ace is probably is still best, most likely. And Ari doesn't think this is too bad of a flop either. There's only really one over card to one his pair. Five. And he believes one that if Joseph did have a hand like ace king, then he hasn't connected yet. I think a 1.5 million chip bet is going to make Ari think very hard about calling with a pair of nines, at least with the queen on the board. It's obvious that Joseph does not have a four in his hand, but the queen could be suspect. Absolutely. I think this bet size is just too much of Ari's stack to call in a speculative situation where he's not quite sure where he's at. So I think he was hoping to flop a set. Otherwise, he does let it go. Healthy fold. Good fold by Ari. 
And Joseph shows the bullets. Let everybody know that he's not bluffing and fluffing like some other players we've seen at the last couple of hands. I think maybe Joseph might be setting up an image for later. He is the chip leader right now, so maybe he's hoping to take advantage of the fact that players might not think he's bluffing later. Okay, so the first stack is Keith. He folds his hand. We go over to Ari Engel. Not happy either. Folds it up. Jose folds the ace over to Kyle. Eight jack suited, one of my favorite starting hands. Really? Well, he likes it enough to go all in there with his stack. I think in an unopened pot in his position with 11 big blinds, it's not a bad hand to shove with. I think it's a smart move. He's passed the big stack of Joseph. And Paul's asking for a count on the button, and he has ace queen, which I would definitely isolate and come over the top and move all in as well, considering Paul only has 15 big blinds. I agree. That's the move to make. You want to isolate this player. And he does indeed do that. And this is going to be for most of Paul's stack, too, if he loses this hand. So, of course, in this situation, you're 60 40. You're really hoping that Ace Queen's going to hold here. Well, over in this will be back in the running with 719,000 chips. Let's see what the flop brings. Here comes the flop right out of the gate. Top two pair. Ace Queen seven. And you know, that is just not much of a sweat for Kyle there. It's pretty much a hammer lock that Paul has on this hand. And with the turn being a five, Kyle is drawing dead. No backdoor, no running outs for him, and he is going to be eliminated in ninth place. Oh, and he ends it with a full house in the river for a little double trouble there. Always more salt on the wound. Yeah, that hurts every time. <laughs> It always feels good to make a final table, but not so good to finish in ninth place. He's going to go home, though, with $13,306. I'm sure we'll see him back at an HPT event soon. You know, some people call this the walk of shame. Some people call it the walk of fame. I don't know what ninth place means, but you should be happy with the money. Life-changing money on the line for these players. With each knockout, the pressure mounts. Come back for more. Welcome back to the HBT. I'm Maria Ho, and this is my guest co-host, Bruce Bucker. Let's get right back to the action. And with eight players remaining, Joseph Sanfilippo is still our chip leader. He's pulling away a little bit from the second place chip lead of Ari Engel. And since the last break, Joseph Sanfilippo is up 592,000, still in first place. Ari Engel's taken a bit of a bump. He's down 362,000. And now we're back with the boys continuing on at 15,30,000 with a 4,000 ante. And action starts on seat two, Jose Montes. He folds king eight of hearts. And our chip leader in seat four, Joseph, decides that he wants to come in with a raise with ace nine suited here. And I think it's important when you are the chip leader to continue the aggression, put the pressure on the rest of the players, continue to increase that chip lead that you have. Aggression wins tournaments. Absolutely. Now it's folded all the way around to seat nine. He lets it go as well. And back to Ari Engel. Ari Engel peels back a pair of sevens. He's in the big line, so I don't doubt that he's going to at least defend here with sevens. I don't really see much value in three betting pre. Kind of stuff was going to happen. And it's round two for Ari and Joseph. Here comes the flop. 7-3 seven, seven, jack, rainbow flop, but a set of sevens for Ari, who checks. A little bait and switch here. He's going to let Joseph see bet this flop. And if I know Ari, he's probably just going to call. I think this is the texture of flop where Ari doesn't feel the need to fast play his set. And Joseph does indeed follow up his pre-flop aggression with a bet of 233000 Ari makes the call. That is a call, ladies and gentlemen. By Turn card coming down. And now I think we'll see how aggressive Joseph really wants to be. Obviously, the turn has hit him, so he probably doesn't think he's bluffing if he bets again. But this is a great card for Ari. I think Joseph's beginning to feel very strong in this hand with that ace on the turn. Five fifty-five. 
And he goes ahead and throws out a bet, 555,000 chips. Ari's certainly going to play this cool. We'll see what he does. Yeah, there's really no reason why Joseph doesn't think his pair of aces is best here. So at this point, he doesn't think he's bluffing. But Ari knows that he's got a set in this spot, and there's no real reason to scare off the person that you're trying to bait. I think he's just going to make the call again. Hmm. Ari goes ahead. He raises it out to 1.3 million. This is a lot of cerebral activity. It's going to go on in Joseph's head to see if he's going to make this call. Looking at that board, it's very hard to figure out what could be in Ari's hand. And maybe that's what Ari was hoping for with this check raise, is to make it look and appear as if he's bluffing and trying to get Joseph off a better hand. And, you know, Joseph decides, nope, I'm going to stick with my ace nine. I'm going to stick in this belief that it's the best hand. This is a very dangerous pop for Joseph. He's drawing dead, going to the river. So we'll just see if Ari could get any more chips out of him. Ten of diamonds comes in on the river, which doesn't really do anything for the board. So it's not giving any clues to Joseph. It's a complete power move to Ari. And Ari's probably just going to go all in here. The pot's already 3.3 million, and Ari has about 2 million left. But he does decide that maybe this board is getting a little too coordinated. He wants to keep the bet size small, hoping to get paid off. And Joseph just can't seem to get away from his pair of aces here. And he does make the call. Devastating pop for Joseph. 5,409,000 chips over to Ari. And that's a huge chunk of Joseph's stack. You saw that they were 1-2 coming in here. And so now he's relinquished his chip lead over to Ari, who is a very dangerous player when he gets his hands on chips. Okay, blinds are going up. 20,000, 40,000 with a 5,000 ante as the action continues. First act is Ari, peeling back a King Jack suited of clubs. No doubt Ari's going to raise it up here with that hand and his newly found chips. It's time to really push the aggression on Ari's part. And back to the man who always has a hand he wants to think about. But this queen nine suited is actually a decent hand for him to act on compared to what we've seen in the past. <laughs> So he does make the call. I think Andy's showing that there's not a lot of hands he doesn't like. And the flop comes. King 7-8, rainbow flop. King for Ari, putting him with top pair. And Ari's just going to follow this up with the standard continuation bet. And he's kind of in a position where, you know what, he doesn't really care if Andy wants the call or not. It's just... In this spot, there's enough chips in the pot. You have to just keep going after it. And Andy doesn't look like he's folding, but Andy doesn't really have anything to call with. So looks like Andy's going to make a play. He does. He makes a play to 200,000. I want this man to play in my home game. <laughs> and I want to be invited to you your home invited, game when Maria. he comes to play. <laughs> Absolutely. And Ari's going to make the call pretty easily here with top pair. Oh, there's always a chance he could have a pair of sevens or a pair of eights in hand, you know, as far as Ari sees. We'll see how the reaction is on the turn, which comes a queen of diamonds. Two diamonds on the board. Puts the queen in Andy's hand with a pair of queens. And now Andy might have gone from bluffing on the flop to thinking he might be value betting on the turn here. But I don't think Ari has any plans to check fold. And he does indeed go all in. He has 470,000. And I don't think Ari's going to do anything else but call here. I look at this as a snapper call for Ari. You can't be folding top pair in this situation. I don't know how much experience he's had playing with Andy coming into this final table, but you know Ari's definitely smart enough to pick up on people's tendencies, and this is him thinking whether or not Andy has the balls, basically, to just make this on a stone bluff because top pair is a pretty strong hand with this board. Ari does call, and Andy sees that he needs a queen or a nine going into the river. Otherwise, he will become our eighth place finisher. Nice hand. 
I don't want to accept any nice hands yet. Good luck. <laughs> And you know, no, honestly, when people try to tell me I've had the hand won when there's one card to come, I'm like, no, let's wait and see the yeah. river. You yeah. never know. I've seen it happen too many times. Yep. And the river's a five of hearts. No help. Ari the winner. Andy eliminated in eighth place. And Andy is going to go home with $16,330, just enough for the buy in for your home game, Bruce. Another player hits the rail at this final table here in St. Louis at the River City Casino. It's time to step aside for a quick commercial break, but when we come back, we will resume action. You're watching the HPT. Welcome back to the HPT Final Table. I'm Bruce Buffer with my co-host, Maria Ho. I have the pleasure of filling in for your host, Fred Bevel. So now, let's get back to the hot action at the HPT Final Table. And Ari Engel has just been on a heater, knocking out Andy in eighth place and also taking a huge chunk off of Joseph Stash to put him as the chip leader now with over 6.7 million. As you can see, Joseph and Jacob are vying for that second spot. And our two short stacks, Peter Brooks and Keith Brody, with about 14 big blinds each. As we begin the action with 20, 40,000 blinds and a 5,000 ante. Action starts on Jose here in seat two. He folds. Joseph Sanfilippo throwing in 40,000 for the call with ace 10 off. Seems like he's a little bit gun shy now, just limping in with ace 10 after that big pot that he lost to Ari. Peter Brooks throwing away the Horatius 6-2. King Queen over to Paul. And Paul's got about 21 big blinds, so he has a good enough stack to play some poker with, and maybe he's thinking about coming in with a raise, because when you do see somebody limp in and you have a decent hand like King Queen, you're thinking maybe I could just pick up all the dead money. Paul throwing in the raise to 85,000, and Jacob peeling back a pair of eights, calls the 85,000. Over to Ari. Who makes the call with a 9-6 suited spades? And when you have the chip lead, you can definitely get yourself more involved with speculative hands like that, just hoping that you can knock another player out and flop a huge flop. He's totally priced in with the pot odds to call this pre-flop raise. Four ways to the flop. The flop is ace, jack, ten, two hearts. It looks like Joseph has flopped top and bottom pair here on this board, but Paul has actually flopped Broadway. 300. Joseph bets out 300,000, putting his feet in the fire again. And Joseph is just in a dangerous position, flopping second best into what's a nutted hand. Basically, that means that Paul has flopped the stone cold best hand he could possibly have, and Joseph is looking for full house outs. Well. But Joseph still has about a 16, 17% chance of filling up, so he definitely has to stay in the action here. Not all hope is lost, especially since Paul decides to slow play and there's no reason why he wouldn't. And the turn is the six of clubs. Doesn't do much for anyone. Joseph asking for a chip count. And Joseph does have Paul cover here, so I'm pretty sure he's thinking about putting it in. He feels like he doesn't want to see another card come off. There is a flush draw on the board. Joseph feels like he's still ahead and he wants to keep it that way. Little does he know, Paul is just going to beat him into the pot here. He makes the bet. Paul goes all in. Snapping it all in. Got to make Joseph think for a second. Right. It's not going to be exactly much less. more for Joseph to call, but so he doesn't like it. And Joseph is now looking for an ace or a 10 on the river to fill up. Otherwise, Paul Felix is going to double through him. And the river comes to seven of clubs. Paul goes ahead and doubles up through Joseph. Joseph definitely taking some shots to the face which most fighters do before they get knocked out. Let's see if he can stay strong. That was a good fly, yeah, we both gin the fly. And Joseph is just seeing his chip lead go all over the place. Paul yeah. Felix, the recipient of a huge pot. Weird. And the action continues with 20, 40,000 blinds and a 5,000 ante. And the first act is Keith peeling back ace-queen off. Players all in. 
Makes the all-in move with ace-queen off. Leading over to Ari. Peeling back a pair of sevens with his big stack. What's he gonna do? And this is definitely a spot worth thinking about. It's marginal. You know that sevens might be ahead of Keith's shoving range because Keith does only have about 13 big blinds. But there are still a few people behind you to act. So he decides that he is just gonna call, which I think is a great call. Not the spot to isolate, but fine if you are trying to eliminate a player to call with sevens. Peter and Paul fold. And now Keith is going to see that it is a classic flip situation for his tournament life. You encounter this in every tournament you play. you got to win flips to win tournaments. Most tournaments are lost with ace-queen. Let's see where Keith can go with this. Flop comes down. Queen, king, nine, all diamonds. Queen on the board. Keith with a pair of queens against a pair of sevens of Ari. Ari does, however, have the seven of diamonds in his hand, so Keith is not quite out of the woods yet. If Ari hits a seven or a diamond, he will retake the lead in his hand. Turn comes, eight of hearts, no help. Pray, pray, pray. I mean, Keith is praying to the poker gods pretty hard now for his hand to hold, for him to survive and double up here. Boom, but it's a two of hearts. And Keith is going to double up this hand, his pair of queens besting Ari's sevens here. And he doubles up nicely to 1.1 million and change, which puts him back in the swing. The high flying action will continue here at River City right after this. Welcome back to the HPT. The cards are flying, the chips are flying. There's a lot of action on the table. Let's get back and watch. Not a surprise to see Ari with all the chips still. He's got 6.4 million. Paul, Keith, Jacob, and Joseph all over a million, so still a lot of play left for them. But Peter Brooks on our short stack with 12 big blinds is still looking for a spot to double up. The blinds continuing at 20,000, 40,000 with a 5,000 ante. Button is on Paul Felig in seat six. Keith Brody, the first to act, folds his hand over to Ari Engel, and Ari Engel peels back. Jack six off, not worthy of his play. And ace nine suited for Jose. And Jose's been fairly tight with his opening range, so you know I'd be really surprised to see him fold ace nine suited though, and he doesn't, so he will open to 85,000. Ace four suited for Joseph, a hand he'll definitely play. He calls the 85,000. Over to Peter. Once again, you just see Joseph running into hands that have him dominated today, and sometimes the cards just don't break your way. Jacob throws it away. Keith peels back. Uh, Jack Queen suited spades. Might as well limp into the action with another 45,000 chips. Three ways to the flop. Jose has the betting lead right now, being the pre-flop aggressor. Flop comes. Ace, King, Queen. Top pair for Jose and Joseph. Jose with a nine versus the four, but still the board's early. We just deal with the flop here. There is a gut shot straight possibility for Keith. Jose bets out 140,000. And actions on Joseph. Joseph wisely folds his ace. And Keith decides to fold and fold his hand face up. And Jose is going to take down a decent sized pot with not a lot of resistance from his opponents. But a nice confidence builder for Jose. First hand I've seen him play in a little bit here. All right, we're up to new blinds at 25, 50,000 with a 5,000 ante. And actions on Keith, and he's going to fold. Over to Ari. Peeling back at two, three suited clubs. Even the chip leader has his limits for his starting hands. He decides to fold. And now action is folded over to Peter Brooks on the button. He's our short stack 
looking for a spot to shove. That would have been a good one if he had anything to really go off of, but he doesn't. I was surprised that Jose folded that 9-8 suited there. Yeah, I mean, Jose's definitely been playing a lot tighter than some of the other players at this table, and I don't know if that's a good strategy or not for him. We'll have to see how it works out. Paul calls the blind with a king five off. Jacob decides to check his option from the big blind with a 6-4 offsuit. Here comes the flop, 6-2-3. Jacob with a pair of sixes, not much help to Paul. Paul has a gut shot straight draw, but he's not going to bet it. He checks it over. Jacob bets out 65,000. Over card, gut straight. Does he make the call? Paul's just thinking off of his stack size. Does he want to just try to call for a gut shot here? Is there enough implied odds and enough equity, really, for him to get some chips from Jacob if he did hit his gut shot and he decides it's worth a try? Eight of spades hits the turn. No help to anyone. Jacob's still good with the pair of sixes. And Jacob decides that he wants to pot control here, checks back with his pair. River brings a four. Boom. <laughs> That's not a good card for Jacob. It gives him two pair, but it gives Paul that gut shot straight he was looking for. Some chips are going to change hands here. Paul bets out 70,000. You know, it's such a tiny bet that even though Jacob doesn't like the texture of the board, he's just going to cry call. Paul picks it up. It's time to take a break from the action and talk to our favorite poker player and legend, Doyle Brunson, brought to us by our friends at Ace Play Poker. You know, Bruce, you and I, we play poker. It's safe. We're in a casino environment. We never feel like anything shady is going on or anything bad's going to happen. But back in Doyle's day, he was involved in some sketchy situations. And Doyle's going to tell us about the time when he ducked an FBI raid from the help of his now wife, Louise. This is going to be fascinating. I'm glued. Let's see this. We got raided. Uh, the FBI got some uh, false information. They came they burst into our house in, in San Angelo and uh, arrested us and took us down and put us in jail. And at that point, I think it's when Louis found out that I wasn't a bookkeeper, but it was too late. We'd been going out for about a year and we were pretty serious. And uh, uh, I, I know we, we, got, we got down there and, and I'd used an assumed name in San Angelo. And uh, they went around and asked all the the football betters if uh, they knew Doyle Brunson and nobody knew him because I, I was Paul Wainer actually. I, I chose that name because he had a brother named Lloyd Wainer. They were Hall of Fame baseball players and I, I had a brother named Lloyd so I, that's the way that happened. And uh, the sheriff told me, son, don't let the sun go down on you in San Angelo. And sure enough, I didn't. I'd wrecked my car. I had to borrow one of Louise's cars uh, to get out of town all. I'd, I don't think I had any money, so. <laughs> At this point in the final table, any decision you make for your chips can be catastrophic. When we come back, let's see who makes the right decisions. Thanks for coming back to the HPT. One of these players is going to win over $142,000. Let's get back to the action. Ari Engel refuses to relinquish his chip lead. He still has $6.35 million, but Paul Felix has actually made some strides now getting to that $2 million chip mark, and the short stack just keeps on getting shorter. Peter Brooks can't seem to find a good spot, and he's down to seven big lines. Button on Paul in seat six, blinds 25-50,000 with a $5,000 ante. And Ari looks down at 8-6 suited and looks like he decides to come in and open this pot with a raise with that hand. And honestly, I'm fine with it. I think Ari has the chip lead. I think that he has a pretty good handle on how the rest of the players are playing against him. So when you're in control of a final table, you should definitely continue keeping your foot on that pedal. But I also like how he changes up its aggression. He knows when to speed and he knows when to slow down. And action is folded around to Jacob. 
who, you know, hasn't been afraid to tangle with Ari. And like I said, it's just about the fact that these two players probably have a, a lot more history against each other than against some of the other players at this table. But he gives it some thought and decides to respect the end of the gun raise. Keith makes a wise call with a 6-5 suited. Keith decides to defend the big blind, but I don't think Ari's someone you want to play out of position with. Flop comes king, 6-4, two diamonds. A pair of sixes for each player. Ari with a better kicker, though, and I'm sure after Keith checks it to him, Ari is going to continuation bet. But, no, he decides that he wants to just check it back here. Again, exercising a little bit of pot control. Maybe he doesn't like that flush draw on the flop. The eight hits the turn, strengthening Ari's hand. Two pairs, sixes and eights. But it's Keith now who decides to bet into this pot, making it 75,000 with his pair of sixes and a gut shot straight draw. Ari wisely raises to 180,000. And Keith decides that he's not having any of that. He's just gonna move all in here and just pray. When he prayed last time, it worked out really well for him. So now he's gonna see he's gonna need a seven in order to win. The five's not gonna help him. And Ari is hoping that this time he will be able to score that knockout. Keith just saying seven, 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 send me to heaven. River comes to three of diamonds. No help, Ari's the winner. Keith is eliminated in seventh place. Ari sweeping in the pot. Keith's gonna go home with just under 20,000, so I'm sure he's not too sad about that. Blinds continue at 25, 50,000 with a 5,000 ante. Now we are six-handed, the official start of what I believe is short-handed play. I want to see Jose, who just folded a7, to start opening up his game a little bit. He's very, very tight. Peter Brooks looks down at a6 and finally finds that hand he has been waiting for. And it couldn't come a moment too soon as he only has seven big lines. Jacob peeling back ace-9. Three aces are on the table unbeknownst to the players. And he pushes it all in. <laughs> Jacob does the right thing, ISOing Peter short stack with Jacob's somewhat short stack. And Jacob does have Peter dominated. So Peter's looking for a six in order to double up here. Flop comes for Jack two. That might work too, actually, because there are two spades. So now Peter does have a backdoor flush draw, but it needs to come runner runner. Turn comes an eight. Jacob's nine kicker is definitely strong at this point. Peter is just looking for a six and only a six on the river. Otherwise, he will be our sixth place finisher. River brings a five. And Jacob is going to take down that pot, eliminating Peter Brooks in sixth place. With a nice win of $22,982. That can make for a very nice weekend of celebration. As the action continues at 25, 50,000 blinds with the 5,000 ante. Five players left at this final table. Jacob throws out a bet with a pair of twos to 100,000. And Ari, right behind him, is not going to make this easy. And this is why, you know, when you have a good player to your left with a lot of chips, you've always got to be cautious. Ari putting out 215000 for the raise with 8-6 off. And this is definitely just a power play with position from Ari. Three betting with that hand is not really because Ari thinks it's a great hand, but it's just because we're shorthanded. He knows Jacob is limited in his options for how he needs to be playing right now. So Ari's going to take advantage of that. I think Jacob's priced in to make this call. Oh, but Jacob's going to do more than call. And like I said, when you've got history with a player, you make moves like this. He's going to shove his 30 big blind stack with deuces because he's banking on the fact that Ari can't make the call. And he's right. And Ari makes the fold. Strong bet by Jacob. Strong show of aggression. Pays us strongly with a 1.9 million chip pot. 
Jacob just got a whole lot cuter after that move. Another knockout at our HPT final table here in St. Louis, Missouri at the River City Casino. It's time to take a quick commercial break, but when we come back, more exciting final table action. You're watching the HPT. It doesn't matter at this point how big your stack is or how small your stack is. One single mistake can be catastrophic to how you're going to come out at this HPT final table. Let's get back to the action. No surprise here that Ari is just increasing his chip lead over the rest of the players. He's got just under 7.5 million, but Jacob and Paul are not going to back down. They're putting up a tough fight, both with over a million and a half in chips and our two short stacks. Joseph Sanfilippo, who did start out this final table as the chip lead, now has just 815,000. And Jose Montes with about 16 big blinds as well. The action continues with 25, 50,000 blinds and a 5,000 ante. Action on Joe. He folds over to Paul, who has pocket sevens, and he's going to make it 105,000 to go. Ari peeling back, ace two suited. And Ari decides to three bet, making it 265,000 to go with his hand. And you know, Jose with ace 10 is just gonna fold. And that says a lot about how with a different kind of player, you see three bets versus folds. Strong raise by Ari into the sevens of Paul with the suited opener only being really a 3% advantage pre-flop to get that flush. And like I said, people with similar hands play very differently. Paul decides to call with his sevens with a similar stack as Jacob, who shoved his deuces against Ari's three bet. So Paul decides to play it a little bit safer. Flop comes eight, king, six, two clubs. Not a much help to anybody. But Ari does have the betting lead here. I don't see why he would ever just check this kind of board. It looks like an easy board for a three better to represent. And he does bet 165,000. Kind of a come on, I want you to call me bet. Paul with his sevens, two over cards on the board. Hard call to make. Yeah, and this is kind of the tough spot that Jacob didn't want to be put in, and that's why he shoved his deuces, just hoping that he wouldn't get called pre. Because when you do call with a pair of sevens and the board comes like this, Sure, maybe you'll put in some chips on the flop, but are you really going to continue all the way to the river with your hand? Turn brings over a seven. What a lucky seven for Paul. Now, Trips on the turn. Yep, now his decision got a whole lot easier. And too bad for Ari, because I think he was on his way to winning this pot if the seven didn't turn. Check. Ari calms down his aggression. This bet will probably push Ari off the table. I think Paul's call on the flop made Ari feel a little bit hesitant about continuing on the turn, and good thing because Paul actually did turn a set of sevens. Ari folds. Nice pot here for Paul, a little over 1.2 million. And I think Ari has a big enough chip lead where he definitely should be doing what he's doing, taking control of this final table. But there's a few players that are standing up and telling Ari, no, we're not just going to let you run us over. Blinds continue at 25, 50,000 with a 5,000 ante. Action starts on Paul, and he looks down at Jack 7 offsuit, and he folds. Jacob folds. Ari peels back another pair of sevens. Just changing hands, changing chips here. And Ari's going to come in with a raise from the button, making 105,000 to go. Jose, I dare you to three bet. I dare you. That's it, Jose. Huh? There you go. That's Get it, it all in there with king five suited. I like it. But unfortunately, Ari's going to have to make this call. It's bad timing for Jose, but I still like to see the fact that he tried to make a move. Bad timing, but you know, Jose does have a king as an out. Flop a king and overtake the lead. Spades wouldn't be bad either. Staying very calm, pre-flop. Here it comes. Flop comes four, ten, four, but two spades, giving Jose a flush draw. 
The turn is a king. Oh, he hits it on the turn. And now Jose's pretty much all set to double up through Ari here. Ari's just gonna need a seven on the river in order to score the miraculous knockout. But no, the five diamonds is not gonna do it. I wonder what it takes to make Jose smile. <laughs> Right? Yeah. I mean, he just hit a three-outer on the turn for his tournament life. He's just, you know, business as usual. I would be a little happy at that point. Bruce, I feel like this final table just began, but I've seen a lot of action already, and now we're down to five players. You know, these five players that are playing, a lot of action on the table, some really good play, but some really poor play. I was surprised to see. So when you're watching this, what do you think of this player's play so far? You know, I definitely agree with you. There has been some high caliber play, and especially coming from Ari Engel, who is our chip leader now. He's really been making it tough for the other players, and unless one of them steps up, he's probably going to take it down. Very true. I just want to tell you people that are watching right now, you need to understand, this is Maria Ho. To some people, and many people, she's Professor Ho. So you should have your pen out and your paper ready and take notes. Not from me, from her, because I'm watching, and I'm listening, and I'm noting too. If you think you have what it takes to sit under the bright lights of this HPT final table, log on to HPTPoker.com. Oh, I can wait you out, but I'll take you down. And I'm the one with the stack showing seven to the jack on Friday, oh mama, cause I'm sending you back. I'll be the last man standing with the money in my hand. I'll be the last man standing with the money in my hand. Last man standing with the money in my hand I'll be the last man standing with the money in my hand